we miss sometimes the spiritual reality here, the spiritual warfare in our congregations. We can cruise along without recognizing what's going on and in mission. And also we can miss the urgency of, of being eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. Welcome to The Same Commission, the podcast from Echoes International about all things mission. Hi, I'm Jim Armstrong. And I'm Matt Pitts. We're with Echoes International. Sharing God's heart for the world and partnering with local churches to support mission. That same Great Commission the Lord Jesus Christ gave us all in Matthew 28 hasn't changed. But in each episode, a different guest will chat with us about a current trend in global mission. So whether you're starting on the journey of mission as a new believer, or you've been faithfully supporting or serving in mission for years, this is a podcast for you. Hello, you're joining us today for the Echoes International podcast, the same commission, and we're delighted that you're either watching us or listening to us uh, today. And in today's episode, we have our good friend, Jonathan Lamb. Thanks for coming, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jonathan. And Jonathan is the former chairman of Keswick Ministries and is now their minister at large, uh, which is a, a title I hadn't heard until today. Yes, normally it's only criminals. Or, uh, or, I, I, or, was, yeah. I was wondering whether to make that joke, but, <laughs> but thankfully you made it for yes. me. Yes. Um, but he's, he's now serving the Keswick movement uh, around the UK and, and internationally uh, as well. Uh, he's a vice president of IFES and he's also the former director of Langham Preaching uh, and continues to train leaders and preachers around the world, as well as teaching regularly at different conferences. He's also the author of many books, uh, and that includes one that we're going to be looking at more specifically today, uh, which is titled Essentially One, Striving for the Unity God Loves. So that'll be a, a really interesting topic. Yeah, our theme for today's podcast is unity in the church or in the mission field. And we look forward to hearing what Jonathan has to say and his thoughts on the topic. Now, I'll ask the, fir the, the first question, which is actually often a tricky one for people who are on the podcast, um, who have been doing their ministry for, for a while. How did you uh, come to, to, the, to this point where you've, you know, you've, you've been serving with Keswick, you've been serving in various different ministries? Can you give us a, a little potted history of, of how the Lord brought you along this way? Um, yes, I'll do my best. Uh, so I'll begin um, with my childhood, if I may, So, um, and I won't be long. Um, I was brought up in a little Brethren Assembly in London, and when I, I came to faith at the age of five, uh, I usually had after a life of crime. And uh, <laughs> this was a, a lovely uh, mission effort of our, our little assembly. Uh, my father was a, a, a fine believer. Uh, his influence was significant. Um, so from an early age, I began to uh, um, follow the Lord. And it wasn't until my teenage years that that really became significant in terms of Christian discipleship. I went to university. Um, that was very formative uh, in, in thinking about Christian mission, actually. That was probably my earliest period of reflecting on that. Um, and quite soon after that, after some teaching, um, I uh, joined UCCF, which is the British student movement, and uh, worked in the West Country down here, including um, Bath and Bristol and down to Exeter and Plymouth and onwards, um, and then was part of the national team for UCCF. From that, um, I was called back to the church we belonged to when I was a student, Belmont Chapel in Exeter, and uh, served there full time for several years, mostly in pastoral teaching ministry, especially working with the younger generation. There were a lot of younger adults at that time, and um, that was the, the focus of my work. And it was during that period that IFES, the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, um, asked if I could, because of my previous student experience, help in... Uh, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, this was during the 1980s, the Cold War. Mm. And although there were plenty of student movements in Western Europe, there was very little happening in, in Central Eastern Europe and certainly not much in the Soviet Union. Um, so I was half time in uh, Belmont and half time with IFS traveling into those countries. And uh, it was a very exciting period actually um, before the war came down and then 89, Everything changed, of course, as many of our listeners may remember. Um, and from then I became full-time looking after um, 
the whole of, of Europe and the Soviet, the Soviet successor states. And we built a team. We moved to Oxford in order to be closer to Heathrow and had a, a larger team working in those territories. So um, that was a, a wonderfully exciting period of, of uh, ministry and certainly mission. For me, it was the, uh, the wonderful opportunity to engage in, in almost pioneer mission in different places. Um, and then from that, um, after quite a few years, um, uh, Langham partnership, which was beginning to take shape, John Stott was alive at that time and wanted to try to find ways of encouraging writers and, and scholars and theologians and particularly preachers. And so I was asked to be heading up the little uh, and pioneering the, the preaching uh, training in different countries. Um, and I did that for about 13 years in all. And it was, again, from ground level up. It's now working in some 70 countries around the world, and uh, it's been lovely to see how that has developed and become indigenous. Yeah. So I still do things uh, in preaching training through Langham or through other agencies. Still a little bit with student work. Um, more particularly now, as you've mentioned, uh, with Keswick Ministries, I've always had a connection with Keswick. Um, but it shares the same kind of uh, ministry goals and principles as IFES and Langham, which is, uh, um, so the Keswick strap line, as you may know, is uh, hearing God's word, yeah. becoming like God's son, serving God's mission. Yeah. Uh, three, three lovely uh, priorities of <clears throat> understanding how God's word uh, changes us and makes a difference in our world. That should lead to Christ-likeness and holiness and discipleship and commitment to his cause and ultimately then to serving God's mission. So uh, I've been doing that uh, for the last few years as well as uh, wherever I can be of, of use actually in the other agencies with which I've been involved. I'm not employed by anyone but simply available to uh, help where, where I can. Is that enough? More than enough. That, 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 yeah. yeah, that was, well, actually, I, I was impressed at how much you condensed into that. Actually. Well, thank that's you. A, that's <laughs> a, and during that, you also helped the Echoes then again. So. Uh, well, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, that's, uh, that's the highest privilege of all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Indeed. <laughs> okay, so let's go for the theme today. Let's jump right in and ask the kind of big question, then we'll drill down, I guess. Mm -hmm. Why is um, it so urgent to address unity in the church on a missional setting? What's, why is it important? Um, yeah, that's a, a key question and, and the core one, really. And I, again, stop me if I go on for too long. But um, for me, there are three, uh, three issues which set the context for this. Um, the first is the culture in which we live. Of course, since Genesis 3, we know that the world in which we live is suffering from fracture at all kinds of levels. In other words, division is, is endemic within our culture. But in, in the present day culture, I think that's even more obvious, the sense of polarization that we experience, the fracture lines, yeah. social division. Um, there's a book I, I read not, not long ago by Tim Marshall um, called uh, walls, why, why we're divided, why we're living in an age of walls. In other words, country after country are erecting barriers. Um, within each country, there are these social divisions. And uh, um, that, that's an element which we see even in the political and, and social media sphere. It's, it's a, a context of, of division. We know that. The second reality, of course, is that the high value of unity in scripture. Mm. Um, for me, the um, the compelling force of, of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, for example, he, he says in chapter one that God's purpose is to bring everything into unity, to bring everything uh, into focus in the Lord Jesus, Ephesians 1, 10. Everything will be added up to find its unity and its shalom, its wholeness in the Lord Jesus. That's the trajectory. Um, the, Paul uses a mathematical term, as you might know. He says everything will be added up yeah. into Christ. And um, the Greeks literally did add up. Well, we add up, but we put our total at the bottom <laughs> on our Excel sheets or whatever. But the Greeks added up, and Paul's saying everything will finally be unified in the Lord Jesus. And, of course, we know from the gospel that Christ's work was to dismantle the walls and was yeah. to uh, create... Um, uh, the the harmony and the uh, the new uh, the new society and that's what Paul says in Ephesians two is God's purpose is to create one new people one one united uh, people so without going into detail we can explore that further but the the thrust of Scripture is God's good purpose to restore everything to bring healing and restoration a new internationalism in Christ through the gospel creating one new family, one gospel. So that is the big vision 
of, of unity, which we need to hold in our hearts and minds, I think, and will inform how we live. The third reality, though, is in relation to our churches. Um, and whilst there are wonderful stories of, of unity and partnership and growth, and you've had a podcast on partnership, I think, um, nevertheless, the story in country after country is one where the Christian community is not always living up to that high calling that we're given in scripture um, the story of of fracture between congregations the story of divisions within congregations the challenges on the mission field because people can't engage together um, globally of course it's estimated there are maybe 30 to 40,000 denominational groups or individual groups um, and as there are a whole host of of challenges in relation to that now the reason for mentioning those three things is that when we come to think about mission or the life and calling of the church, the big challenge is uh, we are meant to be offering uh, a message of reconciliation, the gospel of reconciliation into a very divided culture. And yet uh, very often our own divisions uh, mean that we we preach one thing, but we are demonstrating something different. I, I, in the days when I was with IFS in Central Europe, I did some early visits to Bulgaria and um, was invited to one or two churches to bring greetings, as they say, which was basically an excuse to preach. And um, unfortunately, I hadn't been told when I arrived in the church that uh, at that time in Bulgarian culture, they'd reversed the usual social signals. So to nod means no, and to shake your head <laughs> means yes. And uh, I wish I'd been told that before I started preaching, because I began to preach and I saw the the heads begin to shake like this. So I thought I'd better give it some more energy and passion. So even bigger shaking of the heads. Now, of course, I think that's now changed. It's more, more westernized in that sense. But if we were to do that in our culture, we'd be giving conflicting signals. If we said no and yes, it's quite difficult to do actually, but we're giving two, two different signals. And that's the big challenge with regard to mission and with regard to the life of the church. We say we are all one in Christ. We say this is a gospel of reconciliation. Uh, we say this is a new people, God's new society. And yet by the way we live, by our attitudes, our reactions, our divisions, our failure to engage with, with all of God's people, we are giving a different story. So um, for me, we lose credibility big time in mission if we're not actually living what we proclaim, if the gospel of grace isn't also seen in the way we live and the way we operate as a family. Um, so those are the three contexts, I think, in which this subject for me is, is critical and why I think we need to address it, uh, Jim. And, and actually, that's, that's given a, a real theological overview for, you know, for unity and uh, for for the for the points that that, that bring us together, mm -hmm. I suppose you also touched there upon the daily witness mm -hmm. of the Christian, and the way in which that is that plays out in very practical scenarios. You know, meetings, mm -hmm. um, you know, having lunch with someone, whatever it might be. Um, when we think about the way in which unity often breaks down. Would you say it's it's fair to say that quite often there's it, it's not over something theological necessarily, but it's over some other factors, personal or, yeah. or, or what have you. Um, what would you what would your point be around you know where most where where most breakdowns in unity happen? Hmm. Um, you're right. I think it is multifaceted. And in a sense, even if it was a theological or doctrinal disagreement, nearly always issues of personality, issues of style impact that. Um, there, of course, there are generational differences, um, which are significant. Now, there's quite a lot of publishing about how generations operate, uh, in, even in the British culture as well as internationally. Um, there are generational differences. You know, people's you know, culture, people's view of music, people's view of um, uh, normal life. And those inevitably can bring, makes it a bit bumpy in some of our congregations. Um, then I think there are also um, challenges associated with culture. Um, 
when I was with IFS, we had quite a large number of teams working around the world. Um, over 1,500 uh, young people, young students were involved as graduates in different teams. And those teams were international. Um, just like many of uh, those we're supporting through ECHOs are work working in multicultural settings, not just the host culture where they're working, but often with other other missionaries who are from different cultures. In IFS, I remember one one team almost had to close over one issue, and that was the view of time that the people in the group had. So some were just like me, British, very uh, regimented when it came to time, organized, diary, uh, you know, everything on your phone. Very proper. Yeah, very proper. <laughs> yes, it's, it's almost biblical, in fact. Yeah, you wouldn't, you, we wouldn't call it the right way. Because this <laughs> Thank is you. A yes, you're absolutely going right. out yeah. to lots of people. Yeah, exactly. No, it's not. It's actually in, inhibited, and um, it's, yeah, it's a bad, a bad worldview. Others, of course, whether from Latin America or from Africa, had an entirely different view and were much more relational, probably, or at least put relationships above uh, the time frame. And so if someone turned up, an hour late because they met somebody, that's no problem at all. Now, navigating that for younger younger Christians on these teams was sometimes a challenge. So there was no theological issue there, but it definitely culturally was a was an issue. And and in mission, we can come to it perhaps, but often those are the, some of the rubs. Yes. Um, sometimes, of course, there are personalities. Um, I, I remember thinking about you know in Philippians 4 where Paul talks about two leading yeah, women in the church yeah. we're not entirely sure what led to that but it, it could well have been personality issues as it often is um, sometimes the kinds of divisions in scripture are, are not necessarily theological as you say um, I always think of the Acts 6 story where in the early church uh, there was a fair bit of disagreement about how money was managed in relation to the widows. Do you remember that story? Yeah. And um, again, you could say there's an undergirding, a doctrinal theological undergirding about equality and uh, um, and diversity and caring and so on. But it, it blew up as a as a strategy where uh, which, which had failed in the way money was being distributed to widows. And it's a very interesting exercise how they managed to uh, overcome that. But it, uh, again, is an example of, of a non-theological issue. Um, but having said that, I think mostly the, the fracture lines within churches and often in mission are rooted in theological or doctrinal issues. My experience in churches has been particularly in that area. Um, and I don't know if we will have time, but one of the things that has really helped me in thinking about it is the concept of uh, triage, um, which, which I'll happily briefly explain, and you can interrogate me about it. But So I live in Oxford. We live very close to the John Radcliffe Hospital and the, the A&E department. So if you, you have an injury, you go to the A&E, and the most important person in the room is usually the triage nurse who uh, assesses the nature of your problem. So you've just been shot in the chest, and yeah, you need to see As someone. happens regularly in yeah, Oxford. It is. I mean, I tell you, after knife crime, shooting in the <laughs> chest. Is, uh, yeah. So you, you're, you're top of the list, you know, it's priority. Or you go in and she says, well, uh, you've got sprained wrist. If you just sit there for, I don't know how many hours you have to sit in A&E, uh, a doctor will eventually see you. Or, that's, not, that's not this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, or you, you turn up and she says, yeah, well, here's some paracetamol, go home, you know, have a good sleep and you'll be okay. So that triage process usually divides people into those categories. Now, in the same way, I think it is helpful to look at uh, Christian teaching, uh, Christian doctrine, with that kind of theological triage by asking, what is absolutely priority? What are the things which really we must agree on? What are those primary issues? Yeah. And then second, there is a, another layer of, of secondary uh, issues. Now they are important, they're in scripture, but they're not the priority, they're not the urgent things. So you could actually, you could disagree with somebody on that. So. Uh, and yet still enjoy fellowship. So usually they're the things that might divide us into denominations. So, for example, baptism. I have a number of good friends, evangelical friends, who absolutely committed, as I am, to baptism in terms of its teaching, what it represents, its essential uh, engagement in, in the in the congregation. But they might differ over when baptism is done or how much water you're meant to use and all those things. So that would be, in my view, a kind of secondary 
level issue where we can still enjoy fellowship and still work together, but we may ha have to agree to disagree on some aspects of it. And then that tertiary level would be in the one congregation, in my home congregation in Oxford. We're absolutely clear on the priorities and maybe even on the secondary issues, but there are some issues, um, let's, let's uh, think of s some issues where we, we've made a decision to be within this congregation because we can't, can't quite align ourselves with uh, other issues. It might be charismatic gifts or it might be um, we, we all agree that God is the creator, but precisely how God created and, and um, so on, the, the sequence, the timing, that would be another area for, for um, happy disagreement. So I think the problem has sometimes been in relation to division is that people have picked up uh, um, secondary or even tertiary issues and deployed those as a test of orthodoxy. In other words, if you cannot agree with me on this, what I would interpret as a tertiary issue, then there's no fellowship or we must, we must start a new congregation. We must, you know, break. And so for me, this evaluation, um, is, is quite an important one. And, and scripture, I think does give us hints as to what are the primary uh, issues which around which we must, uh, hold fast and which we cannot compromise on and then other areas where perhaps there is a doctrine of difference which we can come back to if you want to talk about that right. yeah that's a good point to reflect on we'll stop for a moment and come back after the break how can we respond to god's call pray the most important thing we can do is pray pray for our brothers and sisters across the world and for the good news about the Lord Jesus to reach all nations of this world. Learn. Learn more about the needs of the world, unreached people groups or the work of mission organisations. Perhaps sign up for prayer reminders or read biographies of mission partners. Keep yourself informed of how God is moving through his church. Support. Support mission prayerfully, financially, sacrificially. Find out how you can support mission partners already serving or help mission projects set up by local brothers and sisters in other countries. Go. Perhaps God is calling you to go. Speak with those that you have confidence in spiritually and take the time to gain insight and advice from church elders and mission organisations. What a joy to step out in faith knowing that our Lord and Saviour has gone before. Echoes International. Together with joy. Hi, I'm Jim Armstrong, Echo International's General Director, and together with Matt Pitt, our Mission Director, we're here with Jonathan Lamb to discuss the theme of unity within the church and the mission field. So we've talked then about theological triage and working out what what issues are primary you know the gospel and such and and then other issues that might be declared secondary or tertiary we've we we recognize that actually in a in a church on the mission field for example we will have a variety of different persuasions on on these issues a, a, a group of people who have come together for the purpose of mission and we we recognize they need to have an ethos of retaining their unity of maintaining and retaining that unity so what would you say are some of the ground rules then that we might set down if we were if if we were uh, perhaps teaching a church regularly or if we were just just talking to people what ground rules would we be kind of very specifically trying to put in place to protect against uh let's say a tertiary or secondary issue becoming uh, a theological hot potato as, as you call it mm -hmm. um well, I think there are a raft of things that we need to bear in mind. I'll just give some bullet points, I think. Um, one of the important things in the Ephesians passages I was referring to is when Paul comes in Ephesians 4, he, he tips over from the sort of theological argument to the practical. And it's interesting, he, he says, um, live a life worthy of the calling you've received, which is he's just described. But then he goes straight on, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. In other words, he shifts immediately from doctrine to character, to Christ likeness, to godly behavior. And um, I think that we sometimes underestimate how important those words are. Um, be completely humble. 
is it addressing it, the context of, of potential division, um, how to handle some of these hot potatoes. Um, you don't always find gentleness in that kind of uh, environment, but this is one of the words that Paul deploys, or patience, bearing with one another in love. Um, I think it's very deliberate that as soon as he's finished our Christian calling and living in this new community as one people, he goes straight to the question of character. So I think a platform, well, uh, an undergirding in our churches or in our mission communities is definitely to give time and attention and prayer uh, and teaching to the development of Christ-like character. Um, how do we um, uh, approach those issues, those divisive issues? Now, we're not always known as believers for that kind of attitude. Um, I, I, in my little preparatory, preparatory notes, I also put down um, how leaders model um, handling these issues. Yeah. I've just been involved in a rather difficult situation um, in, a, in a, a, a kind of mission setting um, where there's been a great deal of, of division, not theological in this sense, back to what you were saying, Matt, in terms of uh, personality and style and so on. And um, one of the challenges has been related to the modeling of leaders. Um, what strikes me, the word that Paul uses here about gentleness, if you think about the frequency with which he talks about gentleness when it comes to leaders, yeah. um, how you, even how you uh, rebuke someone who's in error, do it gently. Let your gentleness be known to all, he says in Philippians. In other words, this is a quality of leadership which we need to nurture. It's not the top-down, you know, assertive um, populist leader who, who's aggressive. It's the gentle, um, Paul says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So for me, that the issue of character, how we teach and encourage and pray for that, the issue of leadership, how we model, how we handle differences, how we approach these challenges. Um, I think there are other biblical guidelines, and um, I mentioned some of them in, in the book to which you've referred. For example, what Paul says in Philippians 1 and 2 about how we can be of the same mind. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean we all think the same thing, but it does mean that we're sharing the same purpose. We're working for the same goal. Um, we're assessing what, what really matters. We have the same priorities. So I think biblical teaching on some of these passages, uh, the Philippian passages, the Ephesians I've been talking about, um, some of the practical examples in Acts about how they resolve their challenges in, in Acts. Um, the Acts 6 I mentioned a moment ago, you know, with the disagreement about the, the money for the widows, how the elders um, tackled that is very interesting. So they created a sense of ownership. You choose people who can help resolve this. We're going to give our priority to the ministry of the word and prayer. Um, they, they ensured that everyone was heard. They listened carefully to the issues. You know, there are lots of strategies built into some of these stories in Scripture, which are the ground rules for tackling some of these uh, um, these knotty issues. I think also anticipating what might be the issues is worth worth thinking about. Um, so if, if our church has a little teaching program or we're reflecting on what we might want to do, um, well, what are the, the, the issues which potentially could be divisive or around which we must really work hard to make sure we're of one mind and one purpose. Anticipate that, even engage people beforehand with uh, t learning to understand one another's positions or one in, uh, giving um, scriptures different perspectives on particular things. I think there's a lot can be done in a preliminary way rather than hitting all of that when, when, uh, when you're right up against a, a major issue, I think. Um, and finally, uh, I think... Um, for me, um, the, the thrust of the, the book I wrote was related to another verse in Ephesians 4. It's the next verse, verse 3. Make every effort yeah. to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Actually, it's very strong writing where Paul is saying, um, give it everything you've got. Don't, don't relax. Make every effort to, to maintain the unity, preserve the unity. And you're not creating the unity because that's already done through Christ's work. And we belong to the one Father. Uh, Jesus and that's, has redeemed that's us. often forgotten, isn't it? It is. It's all, yeah. We already have the unity. We do. And so Paul is saying, make every effort. And, and repeatedly he urges this sense of, of commitment. Um, 
um, Karl Barth, if I may quote a German theologian, um, says, he translates it, yours is the initiative, do it now. In other words, there's some urgency about it. Work hard at, at sustaining and, and uh, rejoicing in the unity that God has given us across our cultures, uh, the diversity of our congregations, and maybe our, our diverse views. Keep right at the top the urgency uh, of maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. Um, I, I've read uh, various people on the subject, of course, as I've, I've worked on my own uh, book, and several of them said they came from traditions a bit like our own, which holds a very high view of truth and, and wants to hold scripture, take it seriously. Um, and they said, on reflection, we wish we'd given the same amount of energy to preserving the unity of the spirit as we gave to preserving the fidelity you know the commitment to the truth that we've we've held out for so i think that's a that's well said we want to be true to scripture true perhaps to our tradition where that's where that's in line with scripture uh, true to maintaining uh, the commitments that we have as congregations but exactly the same energy must also be given to maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace that for me is a fundamental uh, strategy as you say for for how we respond to these issues <clears throat> This might come across as the kind of cynical question, um, but if you if you bear in mind the breakdown and impact and unity in the church has been since it started, and mm. you you mentioned that six, there's Paul and Barnabas, you can go through scripture and pick mm. them out. Mm. Are impacts and unity just inevitable as long as we as believers are working together? Is it, is is it something we just have to expect? I think so. Yes. Um, that's the end of the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. stop. <laughs> um, but as I reflected, and I think I think it is inevitable. I mean, so we believe in we believe in Scripture. We believe in the work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as Paul says, making us one. We we affirm all of those things. Um, we might be striving hard to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. But I think there are two or three reasons why it's always going to bubble up, which I think is why Paul says, "Keep alert. You know, be be eager to maintain." Um, one is, of course. Um, present company accepted, we are sinful. We are <laughs> self-centered. Um, you remember James says, James 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So the reason for these uh, fights and quarrels, he says, actually are not the externals always. It's, it's right in our hearts. So uh, until we are with the Lord and we're finally like him, um, this is going to be a, re a recurring refrain and and it's good for us to be honest about it and uh, um, I hope one of the functions of this little podcast is, is to remind us watching our own hearts and, and our reactions um, and our own desires that's what causes caused the fights James says in in the in the churches and and can happen today we, we have a, our own perspective our own wishes uh, which subtly are distorted through our sinful nature our self-centered desires we want our position to be the outcome um, so that's one reason I think why we are going to have it until we uh, until we are together as God's people in heaven. Um, a second is that we are children of our culture. Um, and I think that there are two levels to that. The one is, of course, the neutral elements of culture. In other words, um, how I view time, how I view um, uh, how, how congregations should behave, how I view music, how I view uh, children in the congregation. We're, we're culturally shaped and, and those things um, can be the very triggers, as we said earlier, to, to a, a little bit of a fracture in the congregation. But also we're, we're, we're uh, children of our culture in a negative way. As I said right at the top, we, we are in a culture now which is increasingly fractured and divisive and polarized. Mm. And that can rub off, you know, so... Um, you know, you only have to watch the news tonight for half an hour and you see that uh, nationally, internationally, as well as domestically, there's a terrible, terrible, divisive uh, spirit. And, and that can rub off on congregations, I think. So I think that's another element. Um, and, and the third thing, which I think we, we do need to take seriously, is that uh, we are not in a neutral environment uh, our churches and particularly our mission communities and the partners we're praying for and working with through Echoes, we are under sustained attack. In other words, um, there is a satanic strategy, I think, to steal, kill, destroy, divide, fracture, anything that will hinder the advance of the gospel. Um, in my book, I, I was really surprised when I, I chased through several of the 
New Testament passages about division, which indicate this sense of, of satanic engagement, that, that, say, that the devil himself is behind a great deal of this kind of, without over-spiritualizing, it is, it is a, a, a plain fact that if the enemy could knock us aside by dividing us, over the color of the walls in the church or the way the seats are put out or the hymn book we use or you know whatever it is um he'll be delighted to knock us off course so um and i think probably uh, our brothers and sisters who are in mission and whom whom we're supporting through echoes will probably feel this more keenly than we do actually because they're in a new culture and a new context and they're often they can see this is almost satanic what's happening here um so i think that that's a, a third ingredient that we need to mention in the podcast that um it's not simply a clash of personalities there is behind all of this um an enemy who is seeking to destroy mm. and um if you, I, I did a little bit of work on 2 Peter, and if you look at the middle chapter, 2 Peter 2, um, the false teachers, uh, they too are inspired by demons. And, yeah. you know, the, he, Paul, Paul is quite strong in what he says. So I think, the, the, I'm so glad you chose this as a subject, because I think that we're, we miss sometimes the spiritual reality here the spiritual warfare in our congregations we can cruise along without recognizing what's going on and in mission um and also we can miss the urgency of of being eager to maintain the unity of the spirit so uh, for me those are three reasons why sorry we're going to have it the whole no, time right. I mean, the I, whole time it's funny <laughs> we, we've mentioned so in two or three of our podcasts now we've mentioned the attack of the devil in fact so much so we're going to actually do one on mm satanic attack mm. is a reality it in is. the society we it live is. in i yes. think we underplay that a little we bit we do and it's subtle when it comes down to uh, you know our ordinary congregational life yeah. we think yeah. well these are just normal challenges but very often they can be deployed they can be um uh, satan can deliberately uh, work away at these things to create the fact it's funny this is not a question it's more a comment as we reflect on what's being said but call from paul to make every effort it starts with me yes it does you know exactly it's yeah. not a case of just it's uh, that person over there that's the cause yeah, of the yeah, yeah. you know and i think that's what lies behind his language both in ephesians 4 and philippians yeah. about um humility yeah. and and uh, uh patience with one another and looking at ourselves first and uh, how, how we ourselves are responding so you're right yeah just picking up on the, the principles then that we've looked at throughout the podcast today, uh, the principles of identifying issues and, and setting ground rules and also expecting attacks on unity. I'm just conscious we have a number of new mission partners here at Echoes International, uh, which is a great blessing. Uh, the Lord has been continuing to call people into the harvest field, as it were. Uh, and so we've got folks who are who are either new on the field or they're about to go on the field. And there may be others listening today who are in the same position with other organizations going from in different contexts. What are some of the things that uh, someone who is going into a new a new mission setting, uh, what are the, some of the things that they might want to be looking at um, to avoid pitfalls, to avoid causing disunity or to, to be a force for unity? Um, very good question. And we'll pray for all those good people who are, who are signing up with uh, Echoes International. That's fantastic. And it's not for me, I think, to go through all of the cross-cultural issues, which probably have been dealt with in other contexts. Quite dramatic, yeah. won't they? Um, so in, in other words, things like a listening posture as you arrive, that's obviously critically important. Um, and out of our podcast, I think anticipating some of the issues we've been talking about. And in other words, don't be surprised if, if after a, an initial honeymoon, you're slap banging against something that really is uncomfortable or difficult. Um, being prepared, I think, is, is important. Um, I think also um, the, we, we should address the issues we've, we've been talking about in this spirit of prayer. So our, um, our engaging with the team we're working with in prayer, our engaging our prayer partners back home around these issues, um, elevating the issue itself, I think how we work together, uh, um, what our, our, our uh, stance should be as fellow workers, and just lifting that a little bit um, from sometimes you, you, you assume it's going to be easy. You, these are fellow believers. So let's, let's pump it up and say this is an area where we need to be uh, truly focused on, on living Christ-like lives and, uh, and, and helping one another um, to live in line with the gospel. Um, 
the passage which I love most of all in relation to how Christians work together, uh, which I'd like to recommend for all new missionaries, um, Philippians 1, 27 uh, onwards, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in the manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he goes on, uh, I know that you will stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened any, in any way by those who oppose you, and so on. Straight into chapter 2, if you have any encouragement, being united with Christ, any comfort, in other words, share Christ's humility, uh, be like-minded, same love, one in spirit, one in mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, and then uh, have the same mindset as Christ who... And there's a lovely uh, hymn in Philippians 2. So actually, uh, a few studies together in that passage, one, uh, Philippians 1.27 through to 2.11, 2, um, meditating on that regularly, thinking about what does he mean. Um, for me, that kind of preparation, even before you go, as well as when you're there, um, begins to raise all of the issues about how I respond when I'm under pressure and when I encounter these these challenges, some of which will be doctrinal, some of which will be cultural for sure, some personality, some from my own desires, as we've said. Um, but in confronting the spiritual challenges, uh, let's really be uh, undergirded by a commitment to the, the, the values which Christ can form within yeah. us by his spirit uh, in, in community. We always finish with a, a request for prayer. So mm. as we think of your ministry, what can we pray for? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I th apropos of our subject, I think that um, it's really important that we pray around uh, let's think of mission for example some of the agencies that i've been working with um we pray deliberately for the lord's protection and for the lord's um, care for those individuals in those settings i think also praying for those who are training people to be working in those settings um that this should be much more on the agenda um praying for christian character to be formed in our younger leaders and in our our elders elderships and uh, our, our work um keswick with whom i i give a fair amount of time has had the strap line for many years, nearly 150 years, from from Paul in Galatians 3, all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Um, and yet, uh, you know, that that's not so easy to uh, live by, as I've hinted. So uh, for Keswick, for the different, and there are over 90 different events around the world in the, in the Keswick family, um, that that kind of unity could not only be maintained, but also uh, be a a cause for thanksgiving, a cause for mission, a cause for partnerships between churches in some countries who otherwise wouldn't engage together. Um, in, in my own work, I think also uh, I do a little bit with younger leaders and a little bit with organizations. I mentioned one just recently, and I think wisdom as to how to apply some of those principles we touched on for navigating uh, um, either theological challenges or personality differences, um, how, how best to serve in those contexts, I think, is a cause for prayer. And I think, finally, for all of our congregations, um, how we pray for one another um, is an expression of our love and our solidarity as a, as a believing community, and how we pray for other churches mm. in our cities, um, other evangelicals, maybe others who are not evangelical, but praying for God's people, um, and praying for the church internationally i know that you'll be saying this many yeah. many times but i was in a church the other day uh, i was in malawi um, and it's a very poor country and and all kinds of challenges what was so moving to me was that on the sunday services i was there they deliberately every week chose another country to pray for and so when i was there we were praying for india and north and india south and i thought how lovely that the church which has plenty of challenges in in malawi mm -hmm. um was deliberately focusing on the cause of christ in in another country and another yeah. church and that also helps us i think to have the bigger vision of the, the new people of god that paul says is being formed yeah. through christ's work brilliant mm. well i mean there's been so much in our discussion today so thank you i, I, thank I, you, I personally have taken plenty away but i'm <laughs> sure those who are, who are listening um will have done the same but thank you jonathan for coming in today and for being on the podcast we really appreciate thank it thank you very much and thanks to the technical crew who've helped us as well thank you, to you both yeah. yeah indeed thanks Thank you for listening to The Same Commission. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so to continue hearing more about mission. And praying for the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to reach all nations. To learn more about Echoes International and how you can serve in or support mission, 
visit our website at echoesinternational.org.uk or follow us on our social media channels. Thank you and see you next time on the same commission.